All right, I think I'm live. Let me take a look and make sure that my microphone is going. Yes, all right, looks like I got sound. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. It is Thursday, and it is the first Thursday of the month, so you know what that means. It is camera basics time. Let me pull up the presentation. We'll jump in in a little bit here, but thank you all for joining. I appreciate you coming out. Um, I don't have anybody currently in class with me today, so it looks like it's just going to be an online class. Um, we'll go out through everything in a little bit here, um, but thanks for everybody for showing up. Uh, give me a few more minutes just to wait for a few other people to show, get online here, and then we'll jump right into the presentation. I'm going to grab a uh, water bottle for myself, too. I'll be right back. Looks like I got a few more people on here. We're about five minutes into five five thirty there. Let's just jump right to it. Uh, let me just press this button real quick in case I do get a person who shows up for the class. I just realized that I have no picture set up. Switch this over. I probably should have did that before I signed on. Sorry, everybody. All right, well, this works too. Actually, you know, that's probably better. All right, this should do it for us people. All right. Hello. Welcome in. All right, let's get started. Welcome to Camera Basics. My name is Saxon. I work in the small electronics department. I've been teaching the camera classes here for probably about four or five months, maybe possibly six months at this point. Um, we do this four times a, or three times a month, I should say. We do basic cameras, which is today. The second Thursday of the month, which is next Thursday, we'll be doing intermediate cameras. And the final Thursday of the month is going to be drones. Um, Anybody who's been to one of these classes before should be pretty familiar with the class schedule. As always, if you have questions as I'm going through, feel free to comment. I will see the message and then I can answer it for you. I do my best to get all questions answered. If it's not appropriate, I won't read it or maybe I'll say it's not appropriate. Hello as well. Hi. All right, let's jump right into it. So, camera basics. Um, where do you go for help when all else fails? So the first things I tell people um, is to read your owner's manual. The owner's manual has a lot of hoopla that you probably don't need, information that you don't want. Totally understandable, totally fine. The thing with the owner's manual though is it's the first thing that you get with the camera that really tells you everything that you're going to need to know right off the bat. Do you need to know specific specs of how fast that this shutter can go and at what FPS it does this and to what quality of video or photo it can do. No, you really don't need to know all that. But it's really nice to understand the button layouts, where things are on the camera, how to get a better feel for all of that stuff so that way when you're first learning, when you're getting into this, you have a starting point. YouTube is the next most useful thing in the world. I consider myself to be a fix-it-all man. Um, there's not much I can't fix in the house. Um, I use YouTube. Um, I'll work on slowing my, my speak down. My apologies, my apologies. Let me speak a little bit slower. YouTube is another great option. 
You should be looking at YouTube because YouTube has all the different options out there as far as cameras are concerned. And what's awesome about YouTube is you can really look up and see all different, um, let's say, cameras that you're looking at or you can look at the one camera that multiple people are making videos on. So you really can find a lot of information through that. And the last thing that I've been recommending for a little bit is Masterclass. And I don't really know how um, pertinent it is anymore. I feel like I need to start switching it up. Masterclass has been great. I have a lot of customers who like using it. And you do pay for the subscription service for Masterclass. But there's a lot of really amazing people on there who teach you how to do their amazing skills and talents that they've worked so hard to do. Whether that's photography, filmmaking, drawing, gardening. I saw one the other day. I think it was uh, uh, James Patterson, the famous author. And he, he taught one on how to write, how to be a good writer, prolific writer. And I think that's a, a really awesome thing to have. So Masterclass has been great. The next thing we're going to talk about is, before we even get into the camera, understanding a camera, when you take a picture, what happens to that picture? And the pictures get saved to SD cards, um, or memory cards, if you will. There's Compact Flash, there's CF Express, and then there's also SDXC cards. Um, it, my biggest tip of advice is to make sure you have two of them. In case one does not work when you put it in your camera, you can put the other one in as a backup and it's really nice to have that backup, to have that peace of mind. You don't want to go on a long photo shoot somewhere and then find out middle way through your SD card, you know, pooped out on you. Um, and then you find out you don't have any other way of storing these things, so what do you do? Have multiple SD cards with you, always in case something goes wrong. The bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of a low price is forgotten. Uh, fun Ben Franklin quote, I really like this one. I read this at almost every camera class I teach because as much as it's amazing for us to get good deals on our cameras, we have to put into perspective that because we're getting a low price, are we actually getting something that's quality? Or are we getting something to fulfill that want or that need of needing or wanting an object? Therefore, the cheaper the better. That's my argument that I pose with it, um, when, with this, with the saying. When it comes to cameras, oftentimes the more money that you put into your camera, the better quality you're going to get out of your photos. That is the simple truth to it. It always comes down to the photographer, how you're taking pictures, what you're doing. But if you have the correct and the best equipment you can get, you're going to take better photos. Um, and that is the, that's the grand scheme of it all. Now, going back into the memory cards, now that we've broken that down, um, your pictures should never live on the memory card. Uh, and what I mean by that is that should not be the only place that your photos stay. You can delete those photos off the cards and you can continuously use your SD cards. I do it all the time uh, in certain circumstances. I do tend to collect SD cards. But you can then, if you wanted, s take the photos, put them into other places, then delete them off the SD cards. But because of the fragility and how fragile those SD cards can be, I truly recommend not leaving the pictures on there just in case something were to happen to those photos. So what do we do? We've, we went out, we took a bunch of pictures of the family, maybe we did a photo shoot, maybe the dog was in the backyard playing around, so we wanted to take photos. What do we do with that now? First thing you're going to want to do is turn off your camera. Um, Power the camera down, turn it off. You want to make sure you're doing that first and foremost. The second thing you're going to do is wait five seconds. Allow for all of the bits and pieces that happened while you were taking photos to load, to settle down. There's gears and there's electronics moving inside the camera and the last thing you want is for your camera to be in the process of finishing, maybe processing an image and you all of a sudden turn your camera off. Um, or you remove the SD card is what I should say. Wait the five seconds before you remove the card. Afterwards, remove your card. You want to place the card into a reader of some sorts. Now, I say this because underneath I put a line that says, don't use your camera to read the card or send pics from your camera. And the reason I put that on there is because 
it's a really awesome feature to have the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi capabilities on the camera. However, it's two big, uh, big uh, drawbacks. One is battery. The photos will eat your battery life up like crazy. You try to send that photo from your camera to your phone, you're going to take off a good chunk of the battery. And before you know it, those 25 photos you sent over from your camera to your cell phone ate the battery up so much that now you got to put a new battery in there to, in order to keep taking pictures. That might not be a problem, but that could be a problem if you're out and about and you're traveling and you're doing other stuff. So be aware of that. Um, uh, you can use the camera. I don't like to recommend it. Why I don't recommend it is because when you go from the camera to the computer and don't remove the SD card, you've got kind of a, a nothing in between to hold the camera and the computer accountable other than a cable. And if that cable for one reason or the other gets unplugged, jostles in a way that un, you know takes it away from its setup, that can all lead into uh, you losing your photos or possibly damaging your camera or the images or the computer. So it's important to remove that SD card, put it into a reader. Some examples of card readers are down below here. Um, you can pick these up almost anywhere. These are some different variations we sell here at the store. Um, I would say that the one on the left side, so this guy right there, that is my personal favorite. It's a USB and a USB-C, so you can pretty much plug it into any computer, and it reads regular SDs and micro SDs, which I really like too, and it's very small, compact, almost like an old-time thumb drive. Once you've put the SD card into the reader and you have it ready to go, the first thing you want to do is copy photos to a destination folder. And when I say copy, I mean copy. Don't move them. You want to make sure that you're leaving a paper trail of sorts from where you're taking the photos from to where you're putting them to. What can happen is along the way you could lose images. Things could not save properly. Um, maybe the system malfunctioned in a way where when you were transferring the photos, it only transferred 30 instead of 60 photos. You want to make sure that you're copying them so that if you ever have to go back one step, you have the set of photos there ready to go, ready to bring back into, um, into your world. So that's important. Don't move the photos, copy them. When you're copying them, you're going to use Explorer if you have Windows or Finder if you have Maps or Mac. Um, that's just your way of figuring out where they go. And I would recommend that you do them to a folder. Uh, I know I said destination folder at the top, but name a folder. I like to name mine based on when I took the photo. So if I took photos today, I would name it 2223. Um, if I took photos in Christmas, which I know I did, I would name them 122522. Stuff like that. So I know exactly when I took them, what it's for. So let's say I have multiple folders on my phone. I have parents who do, you know, they'll do a basketball game for their daughter, a baseball game for their son, the little one's playing soccer, and uh, a nephew's being born next week. How do I keep track of all those fo fo uh, photos? Multiple folders. Label them what they are. Put a date next to them so that way in case you know you go to multiple baseball games throughout the year or multiple tennis matches throughout the year if someone's given birth to many kids, y you've got them all marked up, ready to go. You know where everything is. Keep organized. And then the second thing is now you want to copy those photos to a second place. And again, it is important that I'm saying copy, not move. We don't want to take them from their one location and put them in a new one. We want to duplicate them so they're in two spots at the same time. This basically prevents us from having any issue of losing photos. Um, I love, in my, uh, in my personal experience and success, I use two uh, hard drives. I keep one inside of a safe and I keep one underneath my computer. If the house ever burnt down, God forbid, or something ever happened, I, in the safe I have a hard safe SD or a, a hard drive that has my work for about 20 years worth of art that I've done. And so that's all available there, and I'm, that won't move. Same thing goes for the one under the computer. I keep that there so that I can then transfer stuff to it quickly, but I have it in multiple spots. Because again, I don't want to come up to the scenario where I didn't store everything in multiple spots, and then I lose one of those spots. You know, if my dog decided to get my hard drive and chew it up, I could lose all of my photos that I've ever taken in my entire life. Um, the house burnt down, a flood. You're planning for the worst. You should always plan for the worst with the photos because at the very end of the day, 
uh, we can always go back and delete, we can always make more and copy more, but if we only have one and it disappears, it's sad to say, but there's no way for us to get those photos back. You can try, but most likely you won't be able to. So, copy your photos from the SD card to a location. Once you feel confident with that location, copy them to another location. You can use an external drive. You can use Prime Photos. You can use Google Photos. You can use any of those. They're great. After all that's said and done, eject the card before physically removing it. Never just pull your SD card out of your computer or unplug your camera. Um, if you do not properly eject it, the chances of you losing photos is very high. It might not seem that way, but because the camera and the cord and everything is still moving, it's all connected so it's computing with each other, what can tend to happen is if, let's say, the transfer doesn't go through all the way and then you go to pull, um, you could technically ruin or damage those photos, lose them forever. Afterwards, put the card back into the camera and don't erase it in the reader. Uh, this is a, one I, I, I mix myself on every time. Technically, if you put the SD card back into the camera, you go into the camera settings and you reformat the card, um, by doing that, you will erase all of the old ones on there and then you'll be able to put new ones on. You can also erase them on the computer and then put the SD card into that system. Um, it's, it works both ways. The reason I like going into the camera first is just because when you put it into the camera and you format inside, you're making that SD card ready for that specific model, um, which is great to do, great to have. Um, but at the same time, if you are someone who just is very particular about doing stuff, I do like to erase everything off of the SD card, delete it from right there, and then put the SD card back in, especially since the SD card was already formatted for that camera when I first used it. Now to go back through the whole step, these are your backup plans. So the first place it lives is in your SD card. That's at the top there, that's that 64 gigabyte guy. When that's plugged into the camera or inserted inside the camera, that is what's taking the photos, that's what's saving everything, that's what's doing everything. From there you're moving it to a computer. You're plugging the SD card in, the SD card is being read by the computer, it then processes the images and then you have them saved in multiple destination folders on your desktop. That's your first location of where the photo should live. From there, you've got now two options, a hard drive or a cloud-based solution. Hard drive is above, the cloud is our cloud-based solution. Um, I think I talked a little bit about Google Drive and Prime Photos, but I believe on the next slide, these are the different variations of cloud-based solution you should be looking at. Google Drive is one of my personal favorites. Everyone mostly has Google accounts, so you can, you're able to save everything and do everything really well from there. OneDrive is another good one if you're familiar with Microsoft and you have Microsoft Office, you use Outlook, anything like that. You might also really like OneDrive. Similar premise, they all function basically the same. They're just all independent of each other, and their menu layouts might be a little bit different. Adobe Creative Cloud is my favorite out of the bunch though because it gives you access to the Adobe suites as well as then the actual editing so or the um, actual cloud based solution. So what you can do with the Adobe Creative Cloud is you can pay for let's say Photoshop, InDesign, Lightroom, a bunch of the stuff that uh, professional photographers use, hobbyists use, intermediate people use, anything. But then you get the cloud based solution. And then to top it all off, my favorite part of the whole thing is that Adobe offers gallery mode or gallery space where you can put any number of photos that you want up on the gallery space. From there, as people are coming onto the, uh, onto the creative cloud, they're able to see all of the images that you have. They can then critique, they can talk about it, but they can edit and do anything that, not edit, but they can basically say anything they want to it. So what I've, happened, what I've had happen before in the past is customers will, you know, or when I was more in college, let's say, I had people that would make a project, they would put it on the Adobe Creative Cloud, and they would put underneath a comment or maybe the title. 
And what you would then get are these comments underneath of people giving critiques, giving honest feedback about how the piece looked. So if you're someone who's looking to do this for art, Creative Cloud could be a really good one. I'm a huge proponent of it, just being someone with a background in the Adobe suites. I've played with it a bunch. Um, it is a membership subscription through them. That's the only thing I will warn. So look into it if you got time. If not, Google Drive's great. Post all the photos you want to Google Drive. OneDrive's great too. Amazon also has a cloud-based solution. So if you're a Prime member, you have access to that. Now let's get into the nitty gritty. Before I really get into framing and the best practices for that, the first thing I do is give a tour of your camera for the basic class. We're gonna go over multiple buttons. Now when we go through this, your cameras might not look exactly like this one does. Your camera might not have 10% of these buttons. Don't fear, your camera has, the, it has almost the same functionality. Everybody's camera and everybody's layout is just slightly different. So starting at the very top, the video start and st stop and start button, it's typically going to be a symbol of a red dot, uh, and that's your record button. When you've got these cameras, almost every single camera out there can do both video and photo. So by pressing that red dot, it's going to start your video and stop your video automatically. Underneath that, we have the power switch. The power switch typically can live in a few different locations. Some people will put it by the mode dial. Some people will put it around the physical shutter release. It's all dependent on the brand and who you're talking with. Um, this is a Nikon camera that we're looking at. So Nikon likes to do the power button in between the, uh, or around the shutter release. After that, you have the shutter release. Self-explanatory, but that's your trigger. When you squeeze on the trigger, that's what's gonna take the photo. That's what's going to uh, make the exposure. Underneath that, you have exposure compensation. This one can get a little bit convoluted or I can talk for a while on exposure compensation. Exposure compensation and ISO are two separate parts of the camera. ISO is the amount of light the camera is letting in. Exposure compensation is your camera's ability to compensate for the light exposure that you have it set for. So for example, if I have to shoot ISO at a certain number, I might go to my exposure compensation and either dial that forward or backward to give the exposure more light or more darkness. Your mode dial is the next one under that. Your mode dial toggles between the various different modes. And I believe on another slide, I break down all the different various modes. So I'm not gonna do it now, but that's where then you'll be talking about things like auto, aperture priority, shutter priority, uh, manual, that sort of thing. That's your, that's your mode dial. Your live view switch, you might see this in a couple different forms. Nikon does this really cool like pullback switch, which I really like. I like the click. You can hear the camera click too. It just feels nice. Um, other people will just do a button that's on the physical camera. But what live view will do is it changes the view or the perception of from going through the viewfinder and the LCD screen. Some people do not like the LCD screen. They'll never use it. They're old school. They like looking through the viewfinder. That's the case, you might want to switch LV to then your settings menu. If you pull back on the LV when it shows you the image, it will get rid of the image. The viewfinder will be the only way for you to see your target, see what you're taking pictures of. But now your touch screen or your LCD display will list all of the camera stats. So what ISO, what aperture, what shutter speed are you shooting at, what type of servo do you have, what type of continuous shooting or burst shooting do you have, that sort of thing. So live view switch can come in handy depending on what you want to do. Also, anybody who's online, anybody who's watching this, if you've got a camera at home, you should be taking it out, play with it, look at it. This is your chance to really click on the buttons, make sure it under makes sense. And then you can always chat, and that's where then I'll reply to your chat and, and help as much as I can. Underneath that, you got the command dial. Now the command dial is a really great feature um, depending on the priority of what you're in, whether that's shutter or aperture priority or manual, the command dial will turn certain numbers for you. So it can raise and lower your shutter, it can raise and lower your aperture, raise and lower your ISO. Depends on what setting you're on and what you're clicking on. But that's what's gonna give you your ability to change. Now if you have a manual or a touchscreen uh, display, you'll also be able to do that there too. But for this Nikon, for example, it does not have a touchscreen display, so the buttons are required. 
or the dial, I should say, is required. From the side view now, take a sip of my water. Flash button on the top there, that's pretty self-explanatory. You click that, it knocks up the flash, and then from there, as soon as you pull the trigger, it'll flash. I had this conversation with a customer earlier. He was asking me about flash reload times. Is there any way to be faster? Is there any way to not let it take so much time? In short, if you're using the camera's built-in flash, no. There is really no way to make it go faster. The camera needs time to rejuvenate, to, to pick up the pace again before it can do another burst of light like that. Now, if you upgrade and buy a professional-based flash or a standalone flash that would hook into the hot shoe of the, shoe, of the camera, completely different story. You then would get something that could load pretty quickly. Function button or FN, you'll see that on cameras, that's a pre-settable button. You can really set that and do whatever you want with it. Um, I, on my personal camera, set it so whenever I touch the function button, it'll actually take me to my Bluetooth transmitter so I can then send photos to my phone, which I know I just mentioned in the beginning isn't the best of ideas. But the reason I would do it, and the reason I might recommend other people to do it, is if you have an image or two that, let's say, your cousin Susie who's sitting next to you just keeps pestering you about, you're on a plane, she's like, I want that photo, I want that photo, I want to post it, I want the photo. You can send it to yourself, then text it or airdrop it or share it with other people. That's the benefit of doing it with the transfer from Bluetooth. It makes it so people who are social media nuts or they have to run a social media page and they're on deadlines, they can send the image to their phone, skip the middleman that is the computer, and get the images. It'll eat the battery up like crazy, but it is an option. Underneath the function button, we have zoom ring. Um, zoom ring is pretty self-explanatory. As long as you have a telephoto lens that goes from a higher or a lower to a higher number, when you move that ring, it'll adjust the actual focal length for the camera, and so it'll make you feel like you're zooming into a subject or zooming away from a subject. Your focus ring, if you're not using autofocus and you turn the focus ring, you're using manual focus. And with manual focus, what you're getting is the ability for you yourself to control the various settings that are there. Um, or not various settings, but the various focusing ability that you have there. Rather than letting the camera dictate what it's focusing on, you can then switch that up and dictate what it's focusing on. Lens retract button, you won't see that on many lenses, but some lenses, some smaller stout ones that maybe don't have any fancy CPU or AI on the inside, they'll have a button that you can't basically turn the lens until you push the button and turn at the same time. And that would be a really great example of the lens retract. Um, lens release lives on the front of the camera body, and when you push in on the camera body and turn the lens counterclockwise, counter it'll remove the lens. Now, if you have a point-and-shoot model or you have a, it would only be really a point-and-shoot. Some people call them bridge cameras. I was corrected the other day. Someone told me it's a bridge. I call them point-and-shoots. I don't think bridge matters anymore. The saying's a little outdated. But um, point-and-shoot cameras are great because you don't need a lot involved. You've got the camera. You're ready to go. No lens, no nothing, no change in anything. It's just, it goes. With interchangeable lenses, you have the ability to get high-powered quality lenses and put them on a camera body that won't change. As long as you know the lenses, you understand those, which we go over that in the intermediate class, that's another day, you'll really get the hang of that and it's a really nice thing to be able to switch between your different lenses to get the exact lens that you need. Uh, last thing is drive mode button. So on the very bottom of the camera or somewhere on the camera, you're going to see all these squares kind of stacked up on each other, and you'll see a timer logo. That is your drive mode. And what drive mode basically does is it dictates the burst shooting or the timer functionality of it. I would recommend playing with it. The timer is nice. You set the timer, click, run to the front of the camera, position yourself, and you can take a fun photo. Um, with drive mode or with the actual burst shooting, let's say you're – at a track meet and your son is about to run in a big circle a bunch of times, when they're getting close to the finish line, you don't want to take one photo of them because it might not turn out well. You want to burst shoot it. You want to take multiple shots on the shot so that way when it's done and said, you have 12 photos of him going across the finish line as opposed to one and out of those 12, you should have a good one. So that's the difference. That's, that's what those all mean there. 
so menu button that'll take you into the internal settings of the an internal settings of the camera um, various settings for film for video for file saving file size um, file naming uh, time and date I mean there's a multitude of different fun uh, settings that you can change in menu Diapeter is going to be the adjustment that you make for your eye. We all view a little bit differently. We all see differently. I've got my glasses on. These are my prescription glasses. When I pick up my buddy's camera, I have to turn the diapeter setting just like on a pair of binoculars until I get my viewing correct. There's the info button. Info will teach you about settings on the cameras or various things, but what I really like info for and what I recommend using it is what we're going to be talking about later in the, in the video is automatic. Using the automatic setting, becoming familiar with that. And so with that, let's say you take a mean picture. You're like, wow, that looks great. What, what did I do? If you click playback, um, which is two down, so we'll talk about that now. Image playback will play back the images that you took pictures of. If you click the image playback button, that is going to then, if you press info, that will allow you to get the stats of what the photo and the camera decided to do. So what I like about that is let's say you're shooting full auto. You go and you click the info button. Now it's showing you that your aperture was 2.8, your f-stop was, uh, sorry, um, your shutter was 1 and 6 hundredths, and your ISO was 800. And it's a good photo. That should be a good starting factor, a good starting point for you, the photographer, to sit there and go, wow, if that's what my camera decided to do based on what my environment or my settings were, maybe that's internally what I should be thinking as I do that. So good feature, good thing to learn about. Focus and exposure lock. As you're pointing the camera, as you pull that trigger to get the image, you can push down on the exposure lock and that's going to lock your exposure into place and not allow it to move. Sorry about that. Um, where that could be help helpful. Let's say you've got a high school photo or maybe a, a prom shot and everybody's standing in a line in front of somebody's house to get a picture. If you are focusing in and you focus in, you've got your right view, everything looks good, press that exposure lock, and now you can just move to the side, take a picture. Move to the side, take a picture. Move to the side, take a picture. The camera has already focused on one location, so it doesn't need to keep refocusing, rebuffering, and taking time. It is now locked to that exposure, locked to that focal length, to that focus, and it'll stay there as long as you stay in a consistent pattern. If you start backing up, moving closer, that's where you'll start to see blur. Um, but usually if you're just moving around, especially in a straight line going in one direction or a straight line going in the other direction, you're totally fine. Uh, we talked about image playback, the I button. Um, I just had a customer uh, talking to me right before the class and they were asking me about the Q button that Nike, uh, Canon has. I and Q are very similar. It's basically a set button. Um, it's a function button, but the function button that has very particular settings to it. And, and those settings usually reveal themselves as you're playing with the camera. Everybody's camera is going to be different. I helped the customer with a Rebel uh, T7 camera, and one of the things that she just didn't understand was why they press Q uh, so many times. And I, and I told her, you press Q to get into the camera and to get to the settings, then you use your dial pad to change and click things, and you press Q again and then locks the settings into place so that way they're there, they're ready to go. That's what the Q button or the I button would do. Multi-selector, pretty self-explanatory. You can move across the board, select different stuff, your settings, your photos. You can either turn that dial on the Nikon or you can actually press the buttons and move in different directions. OK is in between that. That should be pretty self-explanatory. It's an OK button that moves you forward in different directions. Delete button, pretty self-explanatory. If you are getting ready to delete a couple photos, you would just press the delete button. And then from there, it'll delete that photo. It'll ask you yes or no again just to confirm you want to delete it, that sort of thing. Magnify, demagnify. 
self-explanatory as you're shooting. It's not magnifying the image that you see in the viewfinder or on the LCD screen. It's magnifying the final picture. Um, so you take a bunch of pictures. Whew. I can't tell you guys how tough it is when I don't have anybody sitting in front of me and I only have to talk to the screen. I get sleepy. So I appreciate everyone dealing with my yawns. I'm like, I'm going to keep practicing. No coffee today. Uh, magnify, demagnify. You can't magnify the image you see on the screen. You can't magnify the image you see in the viewfinder. But what you can do is after you take the photo, you can actually make it bigger or smaller to take a look and see the pixels, the blurriness, all that sort of thing. So it's a really nice tool to use and to get familiar with. So that way you can use that to kind of investigate your own photos. Now we can talk about the different mode dials, and I put this slide on here because I do like to say that all brands do it a little different, and it's important to remember that. Some people will have it very blanketed and make sense. This is it. Others will simplify it and give you a couple things. Um, the new Canon series, the R lineup, they don't even put a dial on there anymore. It's a little else, a little screen that then you click through to set. So again. Every brand does it a little bit differently. Everybody has their own way of doing things. To break those mode dials down a little bit more, so first things first, we have auto or A+. plus. That is auto control over settings and functions of camera. We have M, full manual control over the camera's array of functions. We have A or AV. Aperture priority or control. We have sh S, shutter speed priority control, or TV. We have P, that's program. Program allows you to do aperture and shutter speed at auto, and everything else is interchangeable, or vice versa. If you want to make shutter priority and, and uh, aperture is uh, auto, you can do that. B is bulb. The camera is fully customizable, but the biggest thing with it, as long as you're holding the shutter release open, the camera will stay open. Great for long exposures, which I don't know if we talk about in this class. It might be more for intermediate. When all else fails, start with auto. I don't care how experienced you are. I don't care how much camera training you've had. These new mirrorless cameras are so stinking powerful that as soon as you point this thing to take a picture, it does a really mean job of taking a good photo every single time. So I really would not get caught up in trying to learn the dials right away. Stick with auto, learn auto really well, and I guarantee you, you'll have little to no issues as it comes to shooting. Using scenes. What are scenes? Scenes are automatic modes. They're the same thing. But what scenes do differently is they give you specific control over a certain subject matter. Um, I won't list all of them because it, it, it's a lot of the times you don't see these on cameras anymore. They've been getting rid of them, um, I would say. Green A plus automatic. That's going to be all day, every day, your go-to. Then there's no uh, flash. It's also automatic, but now you don't have any flash that's going on there. Um, when you look at the dial, you'll see a head. You'll see a flower. The head stands for portraits. The settings that the camera implores are going to be more based on settings uh, that go towards the uh, that go towards the camera. But they're going to give the camera more. What's the best way to put it? More functionality towards the exact thing you're taking. So for the portrait. It's not necessarily going to be this close-up photography thing, but what it'll do is it'll lock on to doing a low aperture number, and it'll make sure that it blurs the background out as much and keeps the person in focus. So that's a good way for portrait. Now macro, on the other hand, will take a nice close-up photo as you put the camera towards it, and it's going to do it in a better way than just sitting there and trying to fiddle with the settings or what have you. So scenes are automatic as well, but scenes are the, the fancier version of automatic that can give you more steps towards what you're trying to do and then focus in on exactly what it is you're trying to accomplish. So 
If you have scenes on your camera, odds are you've probably seen them, never used them, or odds are you've used them and you don't like them. One or the two, typically. My camera doesn't work. I get this all the time. Guys, your camera works. Everything works. Um, there's a saying, I play baseball, or I used to play baseball. It is not the player, it's the bat. It's not the case. The bat is fine. The bat is indented, it's fully, it's got all the wood on it. I don't even know what you want to say. It is the batter. These are very fixable. This is a common issue. It's just the settings that you have on your camera. It could be the lighting that you're taking with your photos. It could be the movement that your hands are doing when you're taking your photos. It could be the way that you're holding the camera. Maybe you don't know how to hold it properly. All can factor into it and all can dictate how your photo turns out. And if you're getting photos that look like this one, odds are you're not doing something right. Your camera isn't a smartphone. Uh, I, you know, I had a customer today, very nice gentleman, but he was pressing me a bunch about the live photos and how certain things work on the phone compared to the camera. And at the end of the, the whole conversation, he asked me, he goes, why would anybody buy a camera if the phone can do all these things that the camera can't? At the very end of the day, the camera will always take a better photo than the phone. I don't care what you say. I don't care how many megapixels you put in front of me. I always show people like this. If this is the megapixel sensor, that tiny little square that I'm making with my fingers, if this is the sensor on an iPhone, this is the sensor on a camera. This is the sensor on a DSLR or a full frame big boy camera. The sensor size will dictate how many megapixels per pixel you're going to get. iPhone 14 is 48, but that's only 48 for the portrait style photos. And again, when you have an image size that that's this big, the second you try to print, blow it up, send it out, do anything with it, the file becomes compressed, the photo turns out trashy, and now people are looking at you like you took all the photos of my prom on your phone and they look awful. And I don't know why I keep going to prom with all this stuff. I have a lot of customers who come in and talk about shooting for homecomings, proms, and stuff like that. I'm 26. I'm not going to any proms. But it's an example I'll use. So your camera isn't a smartphone, and it's important to keep that in mind. The functionality of a camera is it's a camera. Its job is to take a clean, good-looking photo. How you use the camera is all up to you and all up to the, how you do things. Same goes for the phone. Phone takes a mean photo, but if you don't use it properly, you're not going to get the full effect. Holding your camera. It's important that we remember two or three things when we take pictures. One is posture. When we look at the, we'll look at the bottom right corner, we'll look at our lady friend at the bottom right. I can't get my mouse all the way down there since the screen, but when we look at her, we can see that her photo where she is leaning forward and leaning backwards isn't going to do any good for her. Her back is going to be hurting afterwards, and on top of that, she's not stable. Her feet aren't planted properly, so she will be a little bit shaky. Might not be a problem if you have in-camera uh, in stabilization, in-body stabilization, in-lens stabilization, but also can lead to problems in the future. As an artist, the biggest concerns I have are arthritis um, and carpal tunnel. Scariest things to me because I use my hands for everything, constantly drawing, picking at stuff, lifting, but then I'm also taking pictures so my fingers are moving in a funny way, you know? So there's a lot of chances to have problems over time, especially from doing this kind of stuff. So it's important that as we're doing it, we do it the proper way. It's like when you have to learn to lift. You never lift with your back, you lift with your legs, with your thighs, with your knees, where your power is, where the powerful joints are. When you're taking a photo, if you put all the pressure in your rib, chest, and back area, then you're going to start feeling it. It's not going to be fun. Hand in hand with that is your hands. Um, your posture is one thing, but you got to make sure you have the grip on the physical camera set in a certain way so that you're ready to take pictures and you're ready to do stuff without necessarily having this crab-like demeanor. The camera is set up in a way where if you keep one hand on the base of your camera and one hand on the front of your camera, when you go to take pictures, it should turn out good. And the reason we like to do that is because you have hand 
on the bottom for stability, and then you have your hand on the top so that you're able to then take the pictures. The cameras are designed to be that way. They're designed to be ergonomic so they fit in the hand properly and they give you the best grip. You can buy extra grips, you can buy gimbals, you can buy harnesses, you can buy, um, there's one other term I'm looking for, it's slipping my mind now, but you can buy a total, total array of apparatuses to hold your camera. If you don't learn how to properly hold it like this though at some point and you only use those devices, that's fine. But if those devices aren't available and you got to start using the camera by itself and your photos aren't coming out the way that you want them to because you keep moving or your back hurts and now you don't want to take any more photos, this is what you might want to be looking at. It might not be any other ailments that are going on in your life. It might just be the fact of how you're holding and using your camera. So good posture, good hand placement. That's the last thing. Look cool while you're doing it. I mean, you got a camera in your hands, guys. It's not a cell phone. Nobody cares about the cell phones. Cool people use cameras. Anyway. Focus, then shoot. Shoot through the picture. I tell this to so many people because I got a lot of people that will find one spot on the physical photo and that's all they're shooting for. And I remind them constantly. Yes, that might be the trick for portraits or for, you know, specifically, let's go with portraits. But what if you're not taking portraits? What if you're doing scenery? What if you're doing people? It's important to remember or scenery, landscapes, uh, nature, maybe the animals. It's important that you take the whole shot when you're doing it and not just a section. If I just focus on me, I might get me in good detail. But forgetting about my background, forgetting about the placement of all that stuff, that could then lead to a non-satisfying photo. I focus on the whole thing. I shoot through the picture. I'd say eight out of ten times, it's going to come out clean. If anything, it'll be blurry, it'll be maybe dark, pixelated, and that's all stuff that you can just shoot another photo. But it's important. Focus, shoot. Shoot through the picture, through the whole thing that you've got in your little rectangle. That's where you're shooting that picture. If you or the camera are moving, you will get blurry photos. I wish I could say it lighter. I wish I didn't have to say it like that. If you're someone who shakes or you don't have a good grip, you should get a tripod. You should invest in one. They make very, very lightweight carbon fiber and aluminum ones. Carbon fiber is more expensive. But if you are someone who wants to take photos and you do not have a steady hand, buy yourself a tripod. They're forty dollars at the most expensive, or at the least expensive that I've seen. I think all the way up to a couple hundred dollars if you really want to get fancy with it. But if you don't have a tripod and you have shaky hands, you will take shaky photos. Not the camera. It's you. So we've talked about the layout of the camera. We talked about how important SD cards are. We talked about a few other little bullet points that I like to throw in there so you really get a feel for the whole oomph of this. The last thing we're going to get into, I believe, I think this is the last portion of my class. I always get my intermediate and my basics mixed up. We're going to talk about the basics. So what I'm going to do here is this is a subjective approach to how I frame up my images and how I look at pictures when I'm taking them. First things first, fill the frame. I get a lot of people who want to do these shoots and they're very scared of making the person or the item that they're taking a picture of be the entire picture. Don't. We have to remember that there is two types of space within a photo. There's positive and negative space. Positive space is the subject matter. It's the bread and butter of our photo. It's everything that we want to see. Negative space is the filler, is the extra, that don't add to our photos, but they exist because there's positive space. The two go hand in hand, you can't have one without the other. Uh, my example, on our left here, on, on my left, I think I hope it's your left, it could be your right. On my left, we've got the lady and we've got a wall behind her and we see the shadows and the creases and everything else on the wall. Not a bad photo, but it's kind of a dead photo. There's not a lot going on. What is it for? I don't know. Move to the right. Now we have her, but she's in the full frame. 
We've gotten rid of the negative space. We took away the gutter. And now it's just her. So if this were to be used for a headshot, the back of a book, uh, you're trying to frame it up for grandma because she loves a picture of you for the Christmas time or the holiday time, you want to fill the frame. Now let's say you're standing in front of the Pyramid of Giza or you're standing in front of the beautiful Apple Electronics Fountain that displays here at the store. Uh, you might want to now open the space and not fill the frame. That's why I talk about be it being subjective. It's all up to you, the shooter, but if you follow these tips and tricks, I guarantee you at least eight out of, let's say, 50 photos that you take, you'll be more proud of those eight than you were the last week before. Uh, eyes in the top third. If you divide a picture into three different sections, much like the Chicago flag having the blue, white, blue, the north branch, uh, the south branch, and then having the middle space, however you want to word it, when you then take that those lines and you bring them into your photo, you can see where a photo sits. And so in this case, I like this one because the eyes of our guy here, if we were to draw a line through, his eyebrows basically cross through that third section, keeping his head on the top third of the photo. What I like about that is you're bringing more emphasis to his eyes. You're bringing more emphasis to him. We are in this kind of, I'd say, power battle, but when we take photos, we have to remember the significance and the importance and the power that those photos hold. So when we give our subject matter more power in the sense of keeping the eyes in the top third, or I'll talk about hierarchy next, um, we give them more power, which can make our photos feel something a little bit different. If the eyes were in the bottom third, it might feel more demeaning, more lower, and that might show us as the viewer to have more power over our photograph. So again, it, it's all dependent on what you're trying to take pictures of and how you want your work to be framed in the context of what you're doing. Um, but as another trick to help your portraits or maybe some of your other photography um, aspects get better, get stronger. Focus on the eyes. So two things are happening here. One, we can break this into three, into three sections again. Her eyes are definitely at the top third. But then on top of that, her eyes are the main focus. Now, humans as a whole, we like things that are shiny and we like things that are colorful. And if you can prove me wrong and tell me other things that we like when we see things in life or in photos, I'll believe it. A smell is one thing, but you don't get that with photos. Regardless, we have really beautiful eye color coming from our subject here. And the eye color does somewhat match the background, but because of her hair and because of how they change colors as we're looking at them, it's a really fun photo to look at. And therefore, when we look at it, first thing we're most likely going to is her eyes every time. They're in the top third, they're bright, they're vibrant, and we're focusing in on them. The idea of the eyes being the gateway to the soul is a lot of truth, I feel like, in that statement. And I feel like for photography, it's such an important thing because when we have eye contact in a photo, um, it's just something usually truly special. It's something that's you feel a certain type of way, whether you feel kind of creeped out or whether you're excited, you feel open. There's something to it that eyes on a, on a photo really pop. Now, this is where I'll talk about hierarchy. And I said earlier, getting on um, that, you know, when you get it where you're looking down on the person or the person's eyes are on the top third, it hits at a certain angle. It's really nice. In this case, we have probably one of the more common ones I hear that my parents in the store or that the people who are buying a camera want to get pictures of. They love taking pics of their kids. So in this case, we have all these children, birthday party. This looks like a photo that you would take on your phone. And it's silly, it's fun, but there's a lot happening and I don't think that we get the kids properly. When we move to my next photo here, we definitely have another birthday party. We definitely might have a little bit of Photoshop or a little editing action going, but what we have here is someone who scooted themselves down, they've got on a knee, sat on a chair, and took a picture of the kids at their eye level. The kids don't necessarily look any bigger than they are in real life, most likely, um, but what happens here is we no longer have this effect of us looking down in our subject matter. We're now looking 
straight on with our subject matter, which takes the power from us and distributes it to the kids a little bit more, distributes it to the subject matter, gives our subject a little bit more substance to make the image look better overall. When all else fails, they'll go lower. Hierarchy is a big thing. The person who is on the outside looking at the photo should feel powerful. They should feel good. But with our art, with our photos, we dictate what they see. So if we put a subject below us, we're looking down at the subject. They are above them. When we put the subject at the same eye level, it is, it's us to us. It's all we see. And we put them above them. We're now putting them, or if we're putting their view above and they're gazing down, however you want to look at it, we're giving the subject all the power. There's that goofy thing from Star Wars about Anakin and Obi-Wan and Obi-Wan having the high ground. Anakin's melting to death in the fire pits. That is the high ground. These kids have it. We are, we're melting. Vice versa, though, it can, it can flip around. And so it's important to keep that in mind when you're taking pictures to how much power you want your subject or your photo to have versus how much power and uh, how much, you know, um, let's say pizzazz that you want your people that are viewing your photos to have. One of the big things we're going to talk about is the rule of thirds. So I talked about earlier dividing a section into three sections like that. So you got one line there, one line there. You can also divide it so now you have three sections as well. So you got one, two, three, and then you got one, two, three. In between those, you're going to have crossing lines, condescending lines. Those lines will have circles on there to mark the cross points. If you hit on those cross points, you will make a more pleasing photo to the eye because our eyes like things in thirds. Why? I don't have a full science behind it. It's just naturally as a viewer, when we see the... I got one for you. In the painting world, there's this thing called a triptych. And a triptych is three paintings that can be completely separate, but they combined at some point. And when they combine, they either tell a larger narrative, they paint a larger story, or... They have no context whatsoever, but the three paintings live together, so your mind tries to figure it out. When you separate or when you take a photo and it gets our when you look at it, our eyes are almost naturally dividing it into three different sections. Whether or not subconscious we were telling it to, or whether or not that's how we view it, we naturally pinpoint certain things and we lock on to certain things. And what we've discovered as humans, as scientists, as artists, is that when we're taking photos, painting things, if we can pay attention to this, we can maximize the views or maximize the amount of um, eyes that hit it. So first example up, I got my surfer. We're going to have one more term in there. It's called the horizon line. Horizon line is where your um, background and foreground meet. And my example is where the water cuts across the ocean there. That is the background. That is the foreground. Um, so our horizon line is actually located on the same line as the top third section of our uh, photo. Breaking it down a little further though, we've got our surfer and that surfer is on the right line all the way down. And when we look at it, his butt is basically on one cross point and then his shadow's butt is on the second cross point. So we have it where our subject is hitting the rule of thirds nearly perfectly. We have a very dramatic sunset, and there's another rule we're going to throw in there called keeping the sun on your back, or keeping it behind you. I get a lot of people that talk to me about lighting, all these different scenarios. Truly the best studio lighting you can have, side, side, top, front, and back. If you can have that set up and you can have five to six lights going on you at a time or on your subject, you're going to get no cross shadows, no back shadows, no downdraft shadows, nothing. You're going to get a clean, lit up image. But we don't get that lucky, and if you're out in public, that's not the reality that you're going to get. Keeping the sun on this person's back, though, or keeping the sun behind the subject matter helps mute it, but not enough where we don't get the beautiful color, we don't get the full array. Um, what we do end up getting is a harsh shadow that's on our surfer. Identity is muted, but given where his position is, given where the horizon line is, everything else, this makes for a clean, nice image. We love beach photos. They work really well to break down the rule of thirds. One day I'm going to get non-beach photos, I promise. Second one, we got a little girl. She hits perfectly in our rule of thirds. Shoulder blade is hitting the top circle. 
left ankle or right ankle is hitting the bottom one. We have a beautiful horizon line that hits at the top third again. Now with the light coming into our subject matter, we don't necessarily have a clear indication of where the light is breaking from. Um, so I can't necessarily say that she's standing in front of the sunlight, but given it's black and white, it's muted, the colors look really nice. It's a dramatic photo that holds a lot of power to it, depending on the context or depending on how you, the artist, display it. Another example of the um, rule of thirds, now we have a little bit of a hierarchy scale in there, and then there's one other term I'm going to throw in there, and that is descending lines, and we're going to talk about a middle point, or vanishing point, I should say. So, we've got mom and dad on one side, we've got brother and sister on the other. Mom and dad are positioned a little bit higher because they're further back and they're also taller. Brother and sister are in the front section. It's a little nitpicky thing. I need mom and dad to move over like, like a foot, just a foot over. And then basically you'd have this nice line of where the couple, where the mom and the dad meet, you're directly on a center line, and where the brother and the sister meet, they're also directly on a center line. Makes it very even, very symmetrical, very fun to the eye. On top of that, we do have a horizon line. At the current moment, the dad, I'm saying, I would say is covering that, so we don't really get to see the horizon line. But what we do see and how we can determine that is if we look at the buildings behind them, we can see that they're all descending backwards. And they almost look like they're going to vanish at a point. And that point would be reminiscent of a dot on a piece of paper. Maybe one, some people have done this drawing exercise called one point or two point drawing perspective. But when we look at photos and we look at architecture and we look at things around us, we naturally can make a one point perspective and see how lines um, move from that point. So we can see how the buildings kind of fall back on themselves. So again, it's a symmetric, what I'm trying to get at is it's symmetrical, it's thought out, and while it's a simple photo of a father, a mother, a brother, and a daughter, or a sister, it all fits and it looks nice. That's the main key. So how do we make a standard photo that we would have taken with our iPhone or our camera look better? And these are the things that we're looking for. Last but not least, I love showing Jim. He's one of my favorites for the rule of thirds. I think The Office does this the best. Go back through, watch The Office. Tell me I'm a liar. I don't think I am, though. If you look at the way that they film the characters as they're doing it, they usually show the characters in a um, on the rule of thirds. Now, Saxon, why would they do that? I thought we just talked about filling the space earlier and getting rid of gutter space. Who cares about all this stuff? They care. Because in the idea behind this, if you've watched The Office, you know exactly where they're doing this little interview. They're doing it in that conference room area where they've got a plant that's dying and they've got shades on the one side. They paint the picture of where the character is by showing glimpses of the office, of the space. If he was just standing in front of the tan wall, yeah, you might want to cut him down, fill the space up, and then you know, go from there. His eyes would still be on the top rule of third. His eyebrows are basically right there. The rest of his forehead lives above. So not only is his eyes in the top third, his whole body is on one of the rule of third lines. And we're going against the grain of what I said earlier about filling the frame, and we're showing more of the frame so we can understand context of where this guy's at. Again, might help the photo. Sun on your back, this was another one. So I get a couple people that have asked me a few times about this one because they, they debate with me whether or not this is something to do with exposure or ISO. But I can assure you from the photos and how these were taken, um, these are the same settings on both pictures. One of them, the subject matter opens himself up, uses the light to reflect off the fish, uses the light underneath his hat, shows it off a little bit better. In the first photo, the bad photo, hat's down, so we can't really see the face. The fish is in front of his body, and not only is it in front of his body, but it's in front of the camera, the sun, everything. If we look at the next photo, we can see the gentleman turn slightly to one direction, cocks his head to the side. Now he's got the fish in his hand. He's open to allow more sunlight to come this way. 
The fish naturally is going to have a scalier body, so the light will reflect off of him. So he's almost getting a natural light refraction, which is pretty interesting there too. But regardless, what he's doing is presenting himself in such a way where he's opening his body up, letting more sunlight come in, keeping the sun at his back, but using it to his advantage. And that's the point I'm trying to make. Your son is, the sun is your friend. I had a customer in here a minute ago. They were working on a project for school. The professor needs um, 100 to 400 milli, uh, 100 to 400 ISO for the project. And she couldn't for the life of her understand why the photos were so dark. And I explained that shooting indoors, you want a higher ISO. You want to use the light. The light is your friend. That's why people buy lights for the studio and hang them up everywhere. It's not so they can look fancy or have this extra equipment. It's so they can light it up enough that they're going to see everything, get the detail they want. They can always turn things down, turn things up, readjust as they need. But it's a surefire way to make sure that there's enough light. So keeping the light on your back, keeping the sun behind you, opening yourself up to allow or opening your subject up to allow as much light to penetrate is important. It'll maximize the photo clear, uh, clearness, make for a prettier photo. And again, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of guy friends out there who love posting pictures with their fish. I don't get it. I don't do it. I much would rather see the bottom photo than the top photo because at least I know who caught the fish. The last thing I'm going to mention is just to use the app, use your camera app, use your timer. I know I said earlier, don't transfer photos as much, it'll eat the battery life up, but it is an amazing feature that's located on your cameras nowadays. The timer function allows you to set the camera up anywhere that you want, walk in front of it, on your phone, click the timer, boom, 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 ching, takes the picture. Vice versa, you have all these gorgeous photos, you want to get them onto your phone, you want to put them on social media, you're like, I got 10 photos for Instagram right now, boom. Your phone comes in super handy for that. Send the photos to yourself, you can edit them on most of these apps, make some changes, and then post them. So it's a really nice feature to have. It will eat the battery life up, but if that's not a concerning factor for you, go for it. Last thing I'm going to talk about are some extra accessories. Um, I like to always put it this way. Because of that Benjamin Franklin quote I put in the beginning, the bitterness of poor quality only lasts, or the, um, the sweetness of a good price only lasts as long as the bitterness of a poor quality. Put the money into the lenses. The statement I make during the intermediate class is to marry your lenses, date your bodies. You're going to keep buying more camera bodies if this is something you love. What you're not really going to want to buy more of are lenses. The glass doesn't change as you go through these lenses. It'll make adapters and they'll make things for you to bring one over to the next depending on the succession of cameras. But you look at the grand scheme of it, Sony's been using the same mount for 20 years now. Nikon just changed their mount after about 40, 50 years of using the same one. Um, Canon, ah, they like to change. Uh, they like to change things, man. That's the best way to put that. Um, but Canon is very well known for adapters, known for bringing things over, keeping f-stops, keeping shutter speeds. It's really wonderful. So I can't say no to that. To get started, you should have a camera, a strap, a lens, and an SD card. That's it. Four, thi four things that you need. Four things that you need. Um, you can go go and get more stuff. The, the two things I think you should have, no matter what, one extra battery and an extra SD card. That should be mandatory. You don't want your camera to die on you right in the middle of a shoot and then you're screwed. You got to go home, charge the thing for a couple hours. The sun might be gone. Your subject might be gone. Whatever it is. Memory card, if it fails, you want to make sure that you're ready with a backup so that way you can take those photos. You can just waste your time. From there, lens cleaning kits are awesome. I just did the Chicago Polar Plunge. I was a photographer for that this year. Um, and one of the things that I learned very quickly was that I forgot a rag and I had so many people try to splash me. It was um, wild. So that was cold and great. So I have a cleaning kit, have your strap, have your tripod. Um, again, look at the different variations. There's aluminum, um, there's carbon fiber, there's monopods, tripods, video pods. There's something for everything. So look into what you need. External hard drives, you should definitely get one, again, for storage reasons. Various filters, there's UV, 
polarizing, neutral density, colored filters, protective filters, um, even filters that don't necessarily change the color but change the perspective, make things look weird. That's all out there. And they're really fun to get into and learn. Additional lenses. Next class, the intermediate one, we'll talk a little bit more about how to break away from your kit lenses and see other ones out there that you can get. But definitely start with whatever you got first and figure out, I usually like to write a list of like, what's the 10 things that I like about this lens and what's 10 things I don't. From there, bring that into your local camera shop. Talk to somebody about that. Come into Apt. Talk to one of us. We can tell you right away just from what you're doing and seeing that maybe this would be the next step for what you need in your camera evolution. Or maybe this is what you should be looking to do. Or maybe you've got it and you're just not using it properly. That's the other side of it too. Again, user error is big in cameras. And I never, I always like to give people the benefit of the doubt. But when I can tell that someone's just not getting it, I'm really not afraid to say, hey, I don't think it's the camera. I think it's you. So just keep that in mind too. And classes and workshops are the last thing. Uh, you should be a forever student, um, especially when you're in an industry like photography or art in general. There's always something to learn, always something to get better on. And if you choose to just stay complacent with where you're at, with what your skill is, you're never going to really achieve the mastery that is photography. Um, and you're not going to achieve the level of um, mastery that so many of these photographers have. It doesn't matter if you're used to film, doesn't matter if you're used to any of these other mediums. If you choose to just be okay with the cookie cutter and the, the, the first thing you get, you're never going to grow. So continue to learn, continue to take classes, stay up to date with this stuff, and you'll never fall behind and you'll always be above the curve, which is what we always want with photo photography. And that's it, everybody. Thank you for staying with me. That was my uh, basic beginner's camera class. Um, as always, I'm going to stay here for at least another couple minutes if anybody else has any questions. If nobody comments, I'll probably jump off in about five or six. Um, but hit me up with a message. I've got my uh, chat open right now. But for your guys' information, if you don't feel comfortable with asking me a question right now and you're going to need to articulate it or think about it a little bit, my email is on the bottom there. Feel free to email me. If you want to call me here in the store, by all means, my only days off are Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I'm more than happy to try to answer a question for you or give you some sort of answer. Um, next Thursday, so that is going to be, drum roll please, February 9th. February 9th. Next week, we are going to do a, um, we're going to be doing the intermediate camera class. Intermediate, we talk a little bit more about ISO, aperture, and uh, shutter speed, the exposure triangle. We talk about lenses, what lenses you should be looking at, why lenses. Um, and then we jump into just a few more framing techniques and things that I think you should know and have in your arsenal. Um, but yeah, guys, thanks for staying on. Thanks for paying attention. Like I said, I'll keep this open for a little bit longer. Feel free to comment or say something if you got a question. And yeah, that's all I got for you.
It's like watching paint dry when no one messages or comments. I Like two or three weeks or classes ago, I had a day where I had nobody in line. Or maybe like two people were watching and I had all empty seats in my, in my class. And man, oh man, was I tired. I had like four cups of coffee that day, had a lot of sleep. But one of the things that I have learned about myself is that, and I've, in general, if I'm just talking and it's just me repeatedly saying things over and over again, I get droopy-eyed, I get tired, so apologize to anybody who was on that class a couple weeks ago. If you want a good laugh, just check out one of my uh, older camera class videos. You will see me basically like not even close my eyes, like fall asleep with my eyes open and then pop back up and be like, oh wait, what was I saying? I don't even remember. So I appreciate everybody for... Uh, for being on, I got at least, I think, 40 or 50 viewers at one point, so I appreciate y'all. And come in, if you're local in the area, these classes are free. I don't charge anybody anything for them. It doesn't even matter if you bought the camera from apps, um, you know. As long as you're not coming in to ask me about a Polaroid or a Fuji camera, or Fuji film, I should say, the film cameras. If you want to bring in a Fuji actual camera I, I, Fuji's my favorite I love Fuji I talk about Fuji all day um, but yeah by all means guys and like I said email call me any questions you got I'm here in the store every day but Tuesdays and Wednesdays and they like to make me close so I'm I'm literally always here so by all means 